Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to episode 56 of Talking Asperger's with Andrew. My name's Andrew Marsh, and I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome seven years ago. Having previously had a career as a geologist in the construction industry, knowing I was different, but not knowing why. So my diagnosis put everything into perspective. And I now use my experience of working in industry and research that I've done since I've got my diagnosis to help employers better manage people like me, people who have Asperger's syndrome in the workplace. What tips, techniques, strategies can they implement that are low cost, easy to implement so that you can get the best from people with Asperger's in, in the workplace? Because that's what you want. You want all of your employees to work together harmoniously. But you may need to adapt how you give instructions and manage people with Asperger's syndrome from their neurotypical colleagues. And that's what I'm doing with my uh, webinars on a Wednesday afternoon. And I'm going to talk to you today about one of the really important things that can absolutely help you manage people with Asperger's syndrome. Today, I'm going to talk about the use of visual aids to help manage them. Or more specifically, it's what visual aids you can use in giving instructions that can help them understand the brief that you're giving them, the instructions you're giving them, so that the person with Asperger's syndrome can go off understanding what you've asked them to do and then can go and work on the project that you've, that you've given them. Most people who are autistic or have Asperger's are visual. I'm a very visual person. I like to see things. Um, I'm, I'm a fee I, I, I work on my feelings as well, um, but I'm very much a, let me see it. I want to see it and see what it looks like. What, what does this thing look like that we're talking about? And one of the things that I used to do in meetings when I was a geologist, um, we would have meetings, progress meetings and the like. I would color up, I would get a drawing of the area that we were talking about or the area of concern that I had. And I would color it up. I'd get colored pencils and color different areas of the drawing in different colors to signify different topics, different themes, different points on the uh, uh, of information on the drawing. Maybe have some speech bubbles out to highlight the pens so that visually you could see that there was more than one thing going on on the drawing. And I could then discuss and talk about the areas of concern that I had, but put the drawing on the table so that everyone around the table got the opportunity to see the drawing, listen to what I had to say about what my concerns were, where the problem areas were, what I thought were solutions, so that everyone got the opportunity to see, get the idea of what I was talking about, where it was on the site, what the issues were, so that they could then contribute to the discussion on how we can fix the problem or move something forward. So I'm very visual and I like that. And one of the things that, that I do when I work with employees is say to them, um, one of my seven steps, actually, is clarity of instructions. Now you might say, what does that mean? Well, it means when you're giving someone with Asperger's syndrome, when you're giving anyone, doesn't matter whether they're, they're neurotypical or neurodivergent, whether you're giving anyone instructions to do some work, you have to make sure that they understand it. Otherwise, you've wasted your time. And what it means when working with neuro neurodivergent people is that you may need to adjust or change how you instruct them in doing the task that you would for a neurotypical person. Because I like I like drawings. I like to see what's going on. So I, from my experience, um, people on the spectrum like short text, summaries, bullet points, tables, image, something visual. So that the whole package of what you've asked them to do isn't a 30 page email or a 30 page report we will lose the detail we will not pick out that's the key point that's the key point that's the key point there's a target date there's a target date there's a target date if it's just lost in the melange of 20 or 30 pages of an email or a report we won't pick out the correct information and start working on that so when you're using when you're giving instructions and you're using visuals, have a table, have a table. This is what I want you to cover, short paragraph. Have bullet points or, or have a table that says, these are the three things in this section of the of the brief that I want you to, to highlight and concentrate on. A, point one, point two, point three. If there's a time 
element to those. I want point one done by the end of first week, point two done by the end of second week, and so on. Make it clear in that table. Item, point, topic, date. Comments, any other salient and relevant information. That way, the person with Asperger's syndrome, the person with autism is thinking, ah, I can see that. I can understand that there's a, a relevant time scale. There's relevant importance to these three things. They will understand what they're doing and will go off more confident that they understand what you've asked them to do. They say, so that it's a, it's a very old saying, they say a picture paints a thousand words. Well, it absolutely does to a neurodivergent person because we like to see, show me, show me something visual, a photograph, a drawing, a pie chart, a graph, a spreadsheet, a table, bullet points. Show me something that highlights what it is you're asking me to do. Or say, I want you to present this information to me in a manner that I can present to my client and show to my client, to our client, what we have done, what we've achieved, what we're recommending. And so using visuals in that report will highlight the points we're wanting to make which makes it more easily and more accessible for our client to understand and die and uh, and grasp and be happy with when you finished when you finish the job, because I mean I've written lots of reports as a geologist. Part of our one of our main items of of delivering a, a service to our client was the provision of writing reports. So I've written a lot of reports, um, some better than others, some had supervision by others who didn't understand what I was trying to grasp, uh, trying to get across to them. And so there was some um, interplay, some iteration between us to, so that I'm trying to get something across and I've shown it on a drawing or a figure or a diagram. And they're saying, we don't need that. We don't need that. Just get it in the text of the report. I said, yeah, but it's going to get lost. Let's have something visual that shows what we're doing. If we've got a photograph, let's put a photograph in. Let's annotate it. Make it visual so that the client can see when they're looking at page four of the report, see plate one. They can see plate one. Right. I got an image of what's going on. They can read the text and they can relate that to the image in the report. They can say, yes, it makes sense. I understand why you've highlighted this point. And thank you for doing that. That makes more sense to me. going to give you an example of um, something that, that happened when I was a geologist. We had a, a project way up north in the highlands of Scotland, uh, a small village, and the project was to upgrade their roads network around the, around the houses and the village in the, in the village square. So part of the job was to go and do some hand dug trial pits to see what the ground was immediately below the the tarmac surfacing so that we could then take samples test them get the properties of the materials and design the right makeup of the road from whatever whatever that was and i went up there logged the trial pitch took samples and we did all get all the testing array arranged and all the rest of it and i didn't put a photograph of the trial pit i didn't think it was necessary sent the report through to my boss he he approved it went to one of the directors and I'm sitting at my desk doing something else. And my director phoned me and said, could you come through for a minute, please? And I said, yes, of course. And he said, and he looked at this and he said, this trial pit log, you've got two millimeters of tar. You surely you mean 20 millimeters. I said, no, two millimeters. It's, it's as close as I can measure two millimeters. Really? Is this only two millimeters? And I said, yes, I've got some photographs of it. Oh, please go and get them. So, so I went back to my desk, um, I went back to my desk, got the photographs and I showed them. He said, can you highlight that in your report and put a photo, put that photograph in the report and say that we've measured the, the surfacing of the existing road as two millimeters, which proves exactly proves the point that we need to redesign this, uh, this road surfacing to meet current standards, because this clearly doesn't meet the standards. So my director, <clears throat> Thinking that I'd made a mistake by 
noting it in the logs as two as two millimeters should have been 20 millimeters was delighted that it was two millimeters because it shows that the project was necessary that the road surface that they had at this in this village wasn't up to standard and there would be problems with maintenance and, and failing and all sorts so it was absolutely right and proper that we were doing the design to improve the road and have it more durable and more longer lasting and so on so he realized that that photograph of two millimeters of tar on some in uh, on top of sand and gravel was absolutely the best representation of why we needed to do the project and and why we needed to then redesign this road surface so that was something that i missed i didn't click the significance of that at the time but it was only when my director pointed it out to me that it made sense and so that image we actually put that image on the front cover of the report. So we had the title of the report, the title of the client, bang, the photograph, right in the middle, so that anyone who sees the report can go, wow, that road surfacing isn't very thick. What's this report about? Improving the road surfacing. Makes sense. It was a picture that described a thousand words or more. So the use of that image in a... Uh, highlighted the need for the design for the project we were doing and the client was really happy with it going oh didn't realize the current road surface was that bad you better get on and get get the design done and let's get it fixed and uh, get get the right uh, makeup designed and built on site so that's an example of the use of visuals showing quite clearly demonstrating so easily why something was necessary and why something was needed it brought home right there and then from that one image that's why you needed to do this project so if you're using visuals to uh, explain what you want done use plenty of them if 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 you're looking at if you've got six different points you want to make in in the briefing document that you're you're, you're giving to your staff have a a visual for each point it might not might not necessarily be a photograph each time. It might be a drawing. It might be a bar chart. It might be a pie chart. It might be a spreadsheet. But have something visual for each point and then describe in the briefing document in a paragraph what you want and relate it to that picture so that the person receiving the information gets a grasp and gets an understanding. Now, this does not have to apply just to neurotypical people people uh, sorry to neurodivergent people people who have asperger's or autism it will apply to anyone so if you're thinking you've got to do this step extra to make sure that everyone in the team catches on to the idea of what you want them to do actually it's not necessary just for the neuro neurodivergent staff it will help all staff understand what it is you're doing so many of the tips and strategies that i have in my seven steps program work with everyone they don't just work for neurodivergent people, people with Asperger's syndrome. They work for everyone. And if an employer was implementing all of those things that, that I cover in my program, they will be managing all of their staff, all of their teams far better coherently and the teams will function as units. So, these tips and strategies that, I come, that I've that i devised help everyone in the workplace. I'm making specific reference to them because of me being Asperger's, um, how they help me and how they help other people who have, have autism or Asperger's syndrome, but they can apply across the board to all of your staff. And, and if they're impl implemented across the board, you will have better, more equipped employees to go and do the work that you've asked them to do. So visuals are really, really important. One of the things that I like to do, and one of the things that works particularly well for people on the spectrum, is to colour code. Now, um, give you an example. Let's suppose you had a, a a document that had thirty pages, but there were five or six key topics, different points that uh, each each subject covered if you were if you had each of those points covered in with different colored paper 
so that you could immediately see just by looking at the side of the paper or flicking it, you've got six different colors. You were immediately drawn to the fact that there were six different topics to cover, which already starts to get the thinking process of the the people who are working for you thinking there's six things we need to cover here because there's six different six different colors excuse me that one thing that simple thing of having colored paper helps the person understand what it is you're asking them to do six different colors so i need to look out for six different points i need to highlight six different points I need to allow time in my assessment and my working on this project to do six different things it immediately focuses the brain on, in that example, six different things because there's six different colors. It may be that um, in, in your summary uh, section and in, in the briefing document you have for someone, you do that in colored paper so that that stands out. So that if they don't have time, all of the time to flick through the whole thing, they can look at the summary and think, ah, this is what I've got to do. And then they can go back and refer to the main document to see what it is that uh, you're required to do. But color coding of paper is really important. And if doing that, be consistent. So that if you're using a red color for high priority in one briefing document, then use red color for high priority in the next project that you have. So that again, the people doing the work are familiar with your coding and understand red, that's high priority or green, that's low priority or amber is medium priority. That focuses their mind on what they're doing. They get to have a feel and an understanding for what you're asking them to do, high, medium, low priority with the color coding. It's really, it, it's a very simple, but very effective technique. And how much is colored paper compared to normal paper? It's the same price. Or if you were to buy a ream of blue paper as compared to a ream of white paper, it's the same price. So there's no cost implication to it. So it's just a little bit of thought, a little bit of management, how you put everything together, which is what you can do. It is not difficult to do that. So color coding is one thing. Um, having highlighters, and again, you can use highlighters with the same kind of uh, code um, as you have for the colored paper, red for high priority, um, green for low priority, amber, orange, or yellow for middle priority. And you can set that up so that when you're highlighting points, um, if you're giving uh, a, a presentation on a laptop, on a computer, in a computer screen in, in your meeting room, have the background colors the same as the priority. So that when you're doing the high priority items, have the background color as red. When you're doing medium priority uh, information, have amber as the color of the background. And when you're doing lower priority, have green as the background color. That again, reinforces the importance of certain areas of the, of the project as opposed to other areas. And that, that works really well. So having color coding in, in the way that you present information to your teams to brief them on what you want works really well. And then they can use color coding in the, in the feeding back and, and in the report or the deliverable that you're delivering to your client in the same kind of way so that it makes sense, it's logical, it's consistent. One of the key things is being consistent. It's very important to be consistent when you're working with anyone. You know, don't don't suddenly change change color because you felt like changing the color on this project. Anyone who's working on something is, oh, that's red. That's high priority on the last two projects we worked on. I changed it because I felt like red was always using red for high priority. I've used it for low priority this time. Be consistent. Be consistent because that way the people who are working for you will know what are the key areas to deal with and, and so on. And if, you're, if you have um, time uh, time issues in other words, certain areas of the project need to be done before other areas. Again, you can use color coding for that, or you can use different color paper. Again, this is picking out. And if you had it in a table, have the background colors of, if you had six points on a, on a table, have the background color the same as the priority so that the person, when you're seeing it on the screen in, in, the, in the conference room, the person who are, the people who are looking at it can see, there you are, there's the red one right at the top there. That's what it means. 
and the, lo and the lower you go down the table, the lower the priority. The color is changing down to lower priority. That reinforces the, the, the coding that you have, and it makes it so much easier for everyone to understand what is being asked of them, but particularly those who are uh, neurodivergent, who have Asperger's, autism, and the like. So those sorts of simple things that take no time to implement, you know, there's no additional time. A couple of clicks of a mouse is, is, is nothing here nor there to set those things up. And that's how things work to be more efficient, more effective leaders, instructing your teams and what you want them to do. And that's, that's really important because the aim of business is to make money. Let's, let's not beat around the bush. The aim of business is to make money. The way that you do that is important. You want to have highly qualified, well-trained, well-supported, in the right environment. That's how you want your staff to work so that your leaders, rather than managers, and, and I keep coming back to the difference between leaders and managers, your leaders are inspiring your workforce to do great work. That's what you want to do. You want to be able to look out across your teams, knowing that they're working well. If they've, you've got a, a procedure for asking questions and feedback, all of those things add to the culture that you're creating to create a workspace that people want to come and work in and do good work. That's where leadership is so important. And these simple things like color coding, um, prioritizing of the of the colors having visuals makes it so much easier for the people who you are who are working for you who are doing the work to understand what it is you want them to do how you want it to be presented and what the end result is going to be so that they understand what you want you're building a rapport with them so that over time these things become easier more fluent and the business becomes more efficient, even more efficient as time goes on, because they know that red is high priority. They know that amber is medium priority. They know that green is low priority. They know that they would want that you, that you prefer a table and a visual in the in the final report or the deliverable for your client, so that they do it right first time. You're happy with it first time. It means you're more efficient. And you're, you're presenting that information to your client or, the, or your customer who's buying your product. So visual, the use of visual aids in briefing, managing, and delivering your objectives through your teams to your client should be a seamless process where everything falls into place. Everyone understands their role, the priorities involved, the times involved, the quality of what's to be presented. And just think, just like that example I gave of the two millimeters of, of tarmac on the road surface, is there a visual that I can use that best demonstrates the point I'm trying to make, the key point that for this section that I'm trying to make? Is there a visual, whether that's a photograph, whether it's a marked up drawing, whether it's a spreadsheet, pie chart, a graph, a flow chart, Whatever it is, is there a means of visually representing this that means someone can look at it and go, wow, I've got it. And you absolutely want all the people working from you to get it when you've given them some work to do, some instruction. Because if they get it, they'll go away happily and crack on with the work. If they've got questions, they'll come and ask. There's other steps in my seven steps program on checking in and things of that nature. But if you set yourself up well in the right way, you're going to have staff who are confident about what they're doing, who are then confident to be able to come to say to you, I'm quite sure about this. I've got into it after the last half a day or so. Not quite sure. Um, can we just sit down and have a quick chat about it? That's that's great. That's what you want to be able to do. You have that confidence where they you feel that you're approachable. You have to be approachable. If we go back to the difference between a leader and a manager, you want the leaders to be approachable to inspire your teams rather than a manager who's clock watching 
you were a minute late back from break and you were you were two minutes late this morning or you left a minute early for... please don't do that don't be a stop watching manager clock watching everyone doing everything set the environment set the culture so that your teams can thrive so that the individuals can shine and your business will do better trust me on this your business will do better because your employees will be happy they'll feel valued they'll feel as though what they're doing is contributing to the success of the business and when the annual reviews come around share that success with your teammates yes managers are going to get a bigger pay rise potentially but don't skimp on sharing those rewards with the people who've actually done the work. Share it with them because if they get a good rise, they feel rewarded, they'll stay. Your best people will stay. The best way to run a business and have a business that's thriving and profitable and successful is to keep your best people. And the way to keep your best people is to reward them, to support them. These are very simple um, processes, the very simple um, actions that you implement. But I've worked in some places who don't have that culture. They don't have a culture of supporting their staff. They have a culture where they're browbeating them. And they're beating them into submission and people are leaving. There's, when people leave, it costs a lot of money to replace them. Because you, someone's got to look at CVs. Someone's got to place an advert. Someone's got to look at CVs. Someone's got to assess the CVs and say, let's have these five people in for interview. Someone or more than one person's got to interview them. That takes time. That costs money. If you keep the people that you have who are doing great work, making your business thrive and be profitable, you don't have those costs. So... Support your teams. And if that means that you need to go out of your way to think, do you know what? Half of my team are neurodivergent. Make sure that you've got everyone on board the bus. Not just the people who are neuro neurotypical at the front of the bus. Or make sure that everyone on the bus understands what it is you've asked them to do. And everyone is on board and they're all going in the same direction. Because otherwise, people will struggle. There's a, there's a wonderful quote that I heard uh, recently, um, and someone said, "Oh, we're in the same, we're all in the same boat." No, we're not. We're all in the same storm. Some are in yachts, some are in canoes, some are on rafts, and some are clinging to the wreckage. So we're all in the same storm. But where are you, and where are your teams, the people working for you? Are they supported in yachts and they know where they're going? Or are they drifting along, clinging to the wreckage, hoping that someone sees them flagging and waving, going, please help, help? It's a big difference. We're not all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm. You want to make sure that your staff are in the yacht, supported, valued, appreciated, doing good work, rather than the ones clinging onto a piece of wreckage out in the back, nearly drowning. It's your choice. But one of the ways to build that culture is to use visual aids in how you present what you want someone to do and to allow them to use visual aids in presenting what it is you're delivering to your clients or your customers. And I've been through quite a bit there. We've covered quite a lot of ground on use individuals and you will soon get the feel of what is right what works because if your customer's saying hey that was great and they're getting repeat business from long-standing customers then you're doing something right ask them have a have a not what i would call a typical customer satisfaction survey but pick up the phone say hi notice you bought some of our products three times in the last six months would you mind a couple of minutes just explaining why you've done that what it is about the product that you got from us that made you want to rebuy it buy it again and again and again what is it that we're doing that's working for you 
Is there anything we can improve on? Ask your customers. And they'll tell you what's right and what's working. Or the alternative is they go somewhere else and you never find out what was wrong and what was right. And your, your, cust your competitors get their business. Which one do you want? Build the culture. Deliver good quality work for your customers and your clients. They'll keep coming back. Because it's much, much easier to get repeat business from a satisfied customer or client than it is to spend money on marketing and sales to try and find new ones. Yes, you want to find new ones. You constantly want to build. But don't forget the customer base that you have that is supporting you and making your business profitable. So that is today's topic, talked about visual aids. And if you are an employer watching this on my YouTube channel and you're thinking, some of those things resonate with me, wonder what we can do. How can we do that? Please feel free to get in touch. You can get me on my website, which is aspergersmatters.com, which is just up there. Or you can uh, email me at andrew at aspergersmatters.com. There's a contact form on the website as well that you can get hold of me. Or pick up the phone. My phone number's on the website and on my LinkedIn page. And I'd be delighted to have a conversation with you to see how I can help you with my seven steps program or other tips and strategies and techniques that can help you be more inclusive, be more diverse, be more equitable with all of your teams so that everyone works to, the, to their potential. I can help you do that. And I would welcome the opportunity to help you do that as well. So, Please keep a lookout on Friday afternoon uh, for details on, of uh, next week's topic, which will be posted on my LinkedIn page uh, as an event. And if you have any other comments or, or things, please subscribe and like my videos on the YouTube channel. That always helps me build my audience and, and reach out to, 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 to those of you who are interested in what I do. Then please feel free to subscribe and like and comment on the, the YouTube videos on my YouTube channel. But that's it for now. So till next week, thank you very much for your time. Take care and I'll see you next week.